Okay, hello to this uh, show and tell and tutorial on how to use a timer controlled DMA transfer to the GPI output of an STM32. And uh, this mini project resulted from a request from a friend which, uh, who had a rather interesting problem. He has this uh, peripheral which requires a clock signal of 1 to 5 megahertz along with two uh, data signals, this SI and ESH. Now you would usually probably do this with an FPGA, but uh, I'm here to give you some sort of motivation of uh, how to push microcontrollers to their limits and use their full peripheral features. And uh, we are working with the STM32F103, which is uh, which has a maximum clock frequency of uh, 64 megahertz. So that's rather slow if you want to drive a signal like this. And uh, I'm going to show you how to do this. And at the end, we hopefully end up with a signal like this. And as you can see, it's not exactly the correct amount of pulses as it is suggesting here. So this is just a demo to show uh, what is possible with microcontrollers. So this is the source code on my GitHub. I'll link to the, the, the link in the description. So let's jump into the code which I have here in the STM32CubeMX and I'm going to give you an overview of what I did and what is important. So I have the default GPIO uh, output from the Nucleo board the only thing I changed is I have port C defined as a GPIO output. We're only need, gonna need the PC0 and PC1 for our two signals. And we're going to use the timer 2 channel 1 for the clock signal. And before I show you how you set up the timer 2, I'm gonna show you the clock setup, which is driven by the internal 8 megahertz, ramped up to 64 megahertz. Uh, which is going to the timer clocks directly. And the timer 2, therefore, is driven by 64 megahertz clock. So we're going to use no prescaler, counter mode up. And for the period, I have uh, this user define, so we can change the period later in the code. So here, the user constant. And auto reload preload enabled and we need a trigger output event which is the update event this is the event that the DMA channel is gonna listen to and for the clock signal the output compare channel 1 toggle on match so the period has to be double the frequency of uh, the desired clock frequency here and that's all we need from the timer channel Next is a DMA channel, which I set up here, which is the update event from the timer 2, which is a peripheral to memory, uh, memory to peripheral DMA interaction. So we want to increment the memory address, but not the peripheral address. It's going to be in circular mode because it is a repeating pattern and we just want to let it run. Important, we need a data width of 32 bits. So to, to match the output register of the GPIO. So that's the setup here. And over here we have the code. And here I set the timer to period to 16. And if you think about it, we have a 64 megahertz timer. So if it counts to 16, we have updates events uh, at a frequency of 4 megahertz. And if we toggle on every of these we're going to result with half of the frequency so a 2 megahertz signal which is in the range of our desired or the desired range of the peripheral and down here here is the interesting part because uh, which address are we going to write to it is the uh, bsrr register in my case you could do it to the odr register but the ODR register affects every GPIO of this port. So if we only want to change this one, it is going to affect every other. So that's not a good idea. 
we're gonna use support set and reset register so each individual output pin can be either reset or set so if I put a one in here it is going to be set on the next clock and it is uh, stays there until I put a one in here which is going to reset it again that's the whole idea so I just set up a uh, an array of 32 bits which I just decided is going to be 16 samples long and just at the first sample I'm going to set the SI signal high which is uh, in the lower range of this uh, register of the BSRR register and then later one two on the second up or on the third update event I'm going to reset it again and then uh, for the other signal, which is way later, which is on the second bit, which is going to set on the 10th, and reset on the 14th. And that's how you create your bit pattern. Once you have that set up, you can start a DMA on the correct channel, as a source address, the array, and as a destination address, the BSRR register of GPIOC. And it is a circular mode, so it is the length is 16 of this array. And after we set up the DMA, we're going to start the timer. And we're going to start the timer output on channel 1, which is the clock. And very important, we, because the HAL library is not taking care of this, we need to set uh, the UDE bit, which enables continuous uh, update DMA requests. So it continues to drive the DMA. Without this, it is not going to work. But uh, if you have it set up like this, we can look at the scope output, which looks like this. So we have two megahertz on the clock signal. And we can now see uh, the bit pattern. So here, on the zeroth, so we have a bit of a little bit of delay here. So on the zeroth, it is going to uh, set this signal high. One, two, going to set it low. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's going to set the other signal high. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. It's going to set it low. Fourteen, fifteen, and then it's going to start again with this one. And it's probably not exactly correct that this is the delay. It's more like this is the delay. So you need to be aware of any kind of phase misadjustments and delays relative to your frequency, which is another point I want to make because uh, there's always a question of how fast can this go? And we can change that quickly. We have the timer period up here and I figured on this particular device, two megahertz of clock output is the maximum you're going to achieve along with the DMA so that it, the, the chitter and unpredictable phases are manageable. So we're going to increase it to four megahertz and you're going to see quite a lot of chitter in the signal here. So we have a four megahertz signal uh, up here and as you can see if you just uh, watch where the edge of the blue signal is and pay attention what the yellow signal does it just doesn't match at all anymore so there's a lot of chitter and the signal essentially becomes useless at this point so not everything is possible but I think 2 megahertz is uh, quite fantastic for a little microcontroller like this and this concludes this video. I hope you learned something. And uh, as mentioned, the source code is in the description.